Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show. This week we're in Baltimore, where the death and police custody of young Freddie Gray has sparked what some are calling a black spring. It's all become a media event, but how deep is the coverage really going? On our program, we revisit a classic interview with new Jim Crow author Michelle Alexander and talk to activists right here about the roots of the problem and how they are going to make change. Stay tuned. Michelle, so happy to have you. Let's start with where you start with this book, with introducing us to a man called Jervis Cotton. Tell us his story and why you start your book with him. Yes, well, Jarvis Cotton can not vote, um, and his father could not vote, and his grandfather and great-grandfather could, could not vote, all for different reasons uh, in the United States. Um, his great-grandfather couldn't vote because he was a slave. Uh, his grandfather um, was barred because of poll taxes and literacy tests and so throughout his life and his family history um, he's been his family has been barred um, from voting and now Jarvis Cotton today cannot vote because he's a felon um, and branded a felon and is currently on parole so I begin the book with his story because in so many ways it shows how the more things change the more they remain the same and for African Americans and his family uh, none of the black men have ever been able to vote. So you see the continuity of history right there, as you said. Jim Crow, by using that word, by talking about the system that we have today as the new Jim Crow, what are you saying? What do you mean by that term? Well, I mean that we have managed um, decades after the Civil Rights Movement to create something like a caste system again in the United States. Uh, you know, although we're tempted to believe with the election of Barack Obama that we've now transcended race or in a post-racial era, the reality is is that in major urban areas today, the majority of African American men are either behind bars, under correctional control, or saddled with criminal records. And once you're branded a criminal or felon, you're trapped for life in a permanent second-class status. You may be denied the right to vote. Uh, you may be automatically excluded from juries, and you're legally discriminated against in employment, housing, access to education, and public benefits. So, so many of the old forms of discrimination that we supposedly left behind in the Jim Crow era are suddenly legal again once you've been branded a felon. That's why I say we haven't ended racial caste in America. We've just redesigned it. Well, let's talk about that word caste. I mean, for many people, if they're familiar with the word at all, it's not class, it's not race. It summons up notions of Indian, Brahmins, and untouchables, uh, something, a status you're born with, you can't really do anything about. Um, are you really saying that's what we have here? Yes, I use the term caste quite deliberately to, you know, to emphasize, to underscore that I'm not talking here about a situation where poor folks of color are just disadvantaged culturally or, you know, or impoverished or lack education and therefore are having a hard time climbing the ladder of opportunity. No, that's not what this is at all. Uh, I describe in the book a pattern and practice of targeting poor people of color, shuttling them from their underfunded, decrepit schools to brand new high-tech prisons. And this is a system that is enforced by law. Uh, it's a system of laws, policies, and practices that operate to lock people into a permanent second-class status. But there are people who will be listening to this and saying, but what about Oprah? What about Barack Obama? We had the civil rights movement. We don't have de jure discrimination in this country anymore. Yes, well, it's easy to point to the exceptions. Um, but the exceptions, in some way, you know, reinforce the rule. I mean, today, the fact that there are successful African Americans um, makes it easy to blame those who are at the bottom for their fate. But the reality is we declared a war, a war known as the war on drugs, on poor folks of color. Uh, and we have gone into those communities, even though studies have now shown for decades that people of color are not any more likely to use or sell drugs than whites. We've gone into these communities of color, stopping, frisking, searching people in mass, rounding them up, 
for primarily nonviolent drug offenses, primarily possession, and sweeping them into the criminal justice system, branding them criminals and felons, and then stripping them of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. Now, the question comes up, why? And you partially answer it by looking at history. And interestingly, the period that you're talking about, the growth of the war on drugs, the 1980s, parallels the 1890s, post-emancipation, post-reconstruction. How? What are the parallels? Maybe take us back there for a bit. Yes. Well, many of you don't realize that Jim Crow laws uh, weren't passed just out of rabid racism alone. There, were, there was an underlying uh, politics and strategy, uh, an attempt to divide a coalition of poor and working class people of all colors and the populist movement that had emerged. Um, it was the first time uh, former slaves and the descendants of slaves had joined together with poor whites in the South and were fighting for economic justice. And white elites, plantation elites, as well as uh, railroads and corporate power were not happy about the populist movement and this growing interracial alliance that posed a real threat um, to them. And so they proposed Jim Crow laws as a way of driving a wedge between poor people and persuading whites that they should abandon their African-American allies. They were essentially offered a racial bribe. Uh, you know, if you embrace your whiteness and distance yourself from these former slaves and descendants of slaves, uh, you yourself will not be disenfranchised uh, and you'll have the status of your race. Um, but of course, we're not going to provide you the economic rights that you hoped to be entitled to. And for the most part, it worked. Um, by proposing disenfranchisement laws aimed at blacks and a whole slew of Jim Crow laws, soon whites abandoned African Americans and the Jim Crow system swept the South. Well, fast forward um, to the years following the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, you see, well, at least in the end, of, towards the end of the Civil Rights Movement, where you know Martin Luther King Jr. is calling for a poor people's movement, calling for a movement for economic justice that would join poor people of all colors, uh, and you see yet again pollsters and political strategists finding that using racially charged, get tough appeals around race, promising to crack down on a group of people not so subtly defined as black and brown could be enormously successful in driving a wedge. You um, describe the conservatives of the post-Reconstruction era uh, as making those appeals to working class whites to divide them and finding it quite easy, actually, to stir yeah. people up. Are the Tea Parties the, 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 comp the comparison to, to the redeemers of, of those days? Are they the equivalent group today? Well, there are certainly parallels. There's definitely parallels. You know, what's interesting, though, is that what we have today, once again, is a situation where poor people of all colors are being harmed severely by our political and economic policies in the United States. Um, but a race wedge is being used to keep them divided and distracted. Because as you point out, there is only one group of people really that you're allowed to hate these days and say terrible things about, and that's criminals. That's OK. Uh, Absolutely. Criminals are the one group in America that we all have license to hate, which is one of the reasons why it was easy for Democrats as well as Republicans to jump on the bandwagon of the Get Tough movement. And in fact, as I describe in the book, it was President Bill Clinton who escalated the drug war far beyond what his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. And it was the Clinton administration who championed laws, uh, you know, barring drug offenders even from food stamps for the rest of their lives, banning them from public housing. To a large extent, you know, it was the Clinton administration that championed many of the laws that now constitute the basic architecture of this new caste system, and they did so in an effort to win back those so-called white swing voters who had defected to the Republican Party following the Civil Rights Movement. Well, so are you cheered that the moment of Clinton is over in the sense that we're in a very different economic moment and you're hearing from right and left Schwarzenegger, Gingrich and Democrats all calling for 
cutting down and spending on jails and cutting down and spending on the prison industrial complex. Oh, I am absolutely thrilled <laughs> that some momentum is building for prison downsizing and uh, releasing um, you know, drug offenders early or referring them to treatment instead of expensive incarceration. But I don't think we should fool ourselves that this moment where uh, right-wing conservatives um, are reluctant to raise taxes in order to maintain this you know, expensive prison state is going to last that long. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we were to return to the rates of incarceration we had in the 1970s before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement kicked off, we would have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. You know, more than a million people employed by the criminal justice system could lose their jobs. Uh, private prison companies would be forced to watch their profits vanish. This system is so deeply rooted in our political, economic, and social structure that it's not just going to fade away. Uh, we are going to have to engage in real movement building in order to trigger a dramatic shift in the public consciousness. All right, well, let's talk about that because you say it's not through token tokenism or tankering, tinkering, I think is the word you use, that this change will come, but something much bigger. And I'm wondering if there's hope as you see it, in the fact that there are many groups beginning to feel the, the lash of the incarceration system in different ways, but under the first George Bush and then Clinton, you saw spiraling rates of female incarceration. I don't think any group was affected more by mandatory minimums than women. Um, you now have people with debts finding themselves treated or, or you know, asked to take credit rating tests for very basic jobs in the same way that felons are, uh, you know, marginalized in the workplace, more and more white working class people with debts find that they can't get a job. Are there possibilities for alliances there? Or is there no getting around we have to grapple with race? Well, I think there's absolutely opportunities for broad-based coalition building. And, you know, those opportunities must be pursued, absolutely. But if we fail to deal with the racial anxieties and racial divisions and the racial politics that birthed mass incarceration and which have repeatedly birthed caste-like systems in the United States, if we fail to deal with that, even if mass incarceration fades away, a new caste-like system will be born, one that we may not be able to foresee today, just as mass incarceration was literally unimaginable just 40 years ago. Um, as long as, you know, these divide and conquer type politics um, are allowed to play out and we have not yet forged durable, sustainable uh, alliances between poor people of all colors and a recognition and a full appreciation of our racial history and the harm that it has caused not just to African Americans and poor people of color but to all folks. Um, these kinds of caste-like systems I believe are going to continue to emerge. So I believe it's our task not just to end mass incarceration or the war on drugs, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. But you believe that it is possible for us to stop this cycle of, of, of emancipation and de-emancipation. Uh, you believe that a new type of civil rights movement can be born. Absolutely. How? And what kind of work can people engage in if they want to be part of that? You know, what, what's discouraging to me is that when I talk to people in the civil rights community who say, we've just got to be practical, we've just got to be realistic, you know, we've, we've just got to, you know, play the hand that's dealt to us, and, you know, there's only so much that can be done given current political realities. And I am so grateful that the freedom fighters who came before us did not have that kind of attitude. Uh, that the courageous freedom riders, uh, the civil rights activists, um, who risked their lives um, believed that a different America was possible and they brought Jim Crow to its knees when everyone said Jim Crow would never die and so I firmly believe we can build a movement to end mass incarceration, a human rights movement for education not incarceration, for jobs not jails. It won't be easy <laughs> But none of the struggles uh, that have been worth waging in the past were easy either. And uh, I, I think we're at 
a turning point right now. I believe that there is a growing interest in uh, standing up against the system of mass incarceration, insisting that we turn the page on these cycles, um, these caste-like systems and cycles in America. Michelle Alexander's book is The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Nobody's been talking about the economic inequality and this economic violence that's happening all over the city all the time until someone lights a cop car on fire and then there's a tension there. I'm proud of what we've done in Baltimore. Um, I don't condone the violence and the destruction of, of property. However, if that's what, it was, that's what it takes to unite and motivate people, then so be it. It's a small, it's a small sacrifice. Mosby, Mosby. I'm not a reformist when it comes to the system. Um, I think you, you can't reform something that is essentially functioning flawlessly for the intentions of how it was supposed to function. We have to move this from a moment to a movement. You know, a lot of us who've been doing activism over the years, we have been waiting for this. And I don't mean waiting for this in this, we're waiting for another black man's life to be taken, to be disregarded as worthless. We have been waiting for this country, this city to wake up. The only time you ever really hear about it is when people are actually killed. But there are many people who are harmed by the police regularly, arms broken, ribs broken, nose broke. A lot of people here are homeless for various reasons. My family was homeless from 2007 to 2009. My mom hasn't had a job since probably when I was about eight. It's been a struggle trying to provide for the family, especially when you're the only one working, which would be me. It didn't just happen yesterday or two weeks ago. This has been oppression for years now. No justice! What are the systemic issues that result in a young man being murdered? What are the, 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 the issues that result in entire blocks to be abandoned, you know, and neglected? I actually lived in this, this block in this house that you, you know, see behind me. Um, and this is just a quick example of what a lot of Baltimore looks like. The last time I was living here, I was a, a young teen, and the block was full. Every house was occupied. And now in 2015, every, every house is unoccupied. And it's not just here. It's, the next block is similar. Um, this whole community is, is just ravaged. They took resources um, that was allocated for communities and put them in communities where it wasn't necessarily needed. Uh, a, a new movie theater in, in Harbor East, you know, condominiums. None of that helps us here in this community, you know. Um, we pay taxes. We go to work every day, you know, where there is work. There's a serious problem with unemployment. Um, but city officials don't seem to make our community a priority. Baltimore city officials have closed so many of our schools, firehouses even, um, recreation centers, things that was geared toward children in the community and closed them down. This moment right now, when the world is paying attention to Baltimore, um, we need to be focused on, focusing on these structural, uh, systemic issues of economic violence against black communities. Over a quarter of Baltimore residents are paying more than half of their income to housing. The foundation of, of the problems that we think are, are growing. We see about 150,000 cases a year going through Baltimore City Rent Court. That's 150,000 times a year someone's unable to pay their rent. Over 30% of our rental housing in Baltimore is considered uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. It's so substandard. So these are some of the tools, like the amplify the voices, that's what we think. Yeah. Um, I grew up in East Baltimore and I remember it was a SK factory around us and people worked at Bethlehem still and it was happier times and then all of a sudden when the big jobs started closing up the steel mill left uh, you have um, companies moving further out there was no way for them to work you know they didn't have nothing to do but stand on corners 
I was once told, if pressure can bend an iron pipe, what do you think it does to the mind? What do we want? Justice! And when do we want it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't just want a house, I want a community, you know? I want a community when I step outside, there are gardens growing fresh vegetables, you know? There are safe parks for the kids to play in. Uh, there are schools just, just, you go by the school grounds and they're just so vibrant and happy, can't wait for the bell to ring to get in there. We want our community to be reinvested in, but we want to be at the table. We want to be decision makers so that we can stay. You had gentrification, you had the foreclosure crisis, you had urban renewal, you had redlining, uh, you had uh, mass incarceration. These are all these chronic systemic changes that have hit these communities like over and over and over again. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Like, on the one hand over here and then the one hand over there. Pretty big difference. It's really tough to sit here and not remember the conversations with people, the relations, you know, I've had with people here. My friends, associates, they're all gone, you know. Baltimore, my Baltimore. That was our special report on the roots of the Baltimore uprising. Well, indictments are nice, but institutional change is necessary. That seems to be the message bellowing out of Baltimore as she announced charges against six officers in the death of Freddie Gray. State Attorney Marilyn Mosby called for structural and system changes. Why focus on the structural when there's a homicide to prosecute? Well, here's a case in point. It doesn't get more structural than bricks and mortar, and that's at least part of where Gray's troubles started, with lead poisoning. Gray and his sisters grew up in a house with lead paint peeling off the walls. At 22 months old, Gray's blood contained almost eight times the level the CDC says can be dangerous. All the kids had trouble in school. Gray never graduated, and sadly, that's no surprise. Studies have shown that children poisoned with lead are six times more likely to drop out of school and seven times more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. Is Gray dead because of lead? No. But it's not unconnected to the systems of power and racial ranking that did kill him. Scientists have known for years that lead is poisonous. At high concentrations, it can kill, but even trace levels affect the development of children. And yet the U.S. was almost half a century behind other countries in banning lead paint. Why? Ask the powerful Lead Industries Association, which thwarted public health efforts for years. Public health paid for private profits, and African Americans paid most of all. At the time of the ban in 1978, a national survey found that black children were six times more likely to have elevated lead in their systems than whites. And as if that wasn't enough, in the 1990s, as Gray was growing up, a Johns Hopkins study in Baltimore enrolled slumlords to move poor families into homes where kids were exposed to levels of lead that were known to cause permanent damage for the sake of science. Those families weren't wealthy whites, nor was this the first time black lives were sacrificed for white public health research. Written up in the book Lead Wars, the Johns Hopkins lead study was compared to the Tuskegee experiment, in which hundreds of black men with syphilis were denied life-saving penicillin for decades, also for research purposes. There's a reason the Black Panthers community health clinics conducted lead screenings. Gray's poisoning wasn't personal, it was political and structural. You can tell me what you think by writing to me, laura at grittv.org. And thanks. Ruth Wilson Gilmore discusses reform and revolution. There have to be other ways that we think about the problem of harm and what to do about it, and that we get away from thinking that 
all crime is about harm. And Monica Jones, a young transgender activist. Just going through the whole justice system is violence. I used to think the financial system was broken, but after doing this research, I think it's not broken, it's rigged. It's actually working as it's designed to work. The segregation that was created by these federal policies going back to the 1930s made, it made black and Latino communities targets for this kind of lending. It's a lot of systemic issues that have lends itself to the issues that we're facing now. Don't shoot at 